Okay, so now that's true about photons, x-rays. What about electrons? And um, in 1927, these D Davison and Germer were working at the, what was then Bell Laboratories. And they, and you can see in his hand, he's got a, he's got a basically a gas discharge tube. But they were doing something very interesting. Uh, what they were interested in doing was to take these uh, electrons that had been used, that the people had been using to make x-rays, but said to themselves, if I can make a monochromatic beam of x-rays, of electrons, I should be able to diffract from them. Or actually, they were actually looking at scattery, scattering of electrons from um, an anode simply because they knew electrons interact very strongly with atoms. And what they did was they, they would make these kinds of measurements. So in this graph, what I'm plotting is here's their, their target, which is the anode, and they have an electron beam coming right down here to smack into the target. And you know if there's a, a really high voltage, you will generate x-rays. In their experiments, they had very low voltages. You can see, I think that's 54 volts. Yeah, 54 volts. And so they had just 54 volts, so they're not going to generate any x-rays. These electrons come down, and for the most part, when they hit the anode, they give up their energy as heat. But what they did is they had the detector inside the gas discharge tube and started moving it to look at what about the electrons that bounce off? And what they found, so this side, so forget it, look at this side. I think this is the 54 volt one. The dark one here is 54 volts. What they found is it's not just a, a uniform distribution. In fact, there's a big bulge here at 54 volts at around 50 degrees. And what they noticed is if you change the voltage, so this dark one on this side is 65 volts, that the uh, bulge um, moved up. See, so that one is less than 45 degrees. Here it was 50 degrees. And the other thing they did, which was really very cool, is that they, um, Fix the position of the detector. So let's say you put, uh, let's say you put your detector at 50 degrees, and you start varying the voltage. So this is intensity at your detector, the number of electrons per unit time that you measure, and this is fixed angle. I'll call it phi. Uh, in this case, it was 50 degrees. And what you see if you had, and, and down here they plotted square root of voltage. And uh, what they found is that they get a peak like this at, uh, well, the square root of 54. And then you go along, and then the, the, it would drop. And then you'd go along and you'd see another peak. Very strange. So what was happening? Now, what I forgot to tell you is, that their target was a single crystal of nickel again. Here we go again. Right. It was a single crystal of nickel with the 111 plane flat on the surface. Nickel. Electrons are coming down, smacking into it, and coming off at preferred angles, yeah, like that, 50 degrees. And that was when it was 54 volts. So remember, this is 1927. Just as people were really, that were realizing that, there might, that you know, particles were waves and that sort of thing. And so in fact, in fact, what they were observing was diffraction of electrons, of particles. So this was 1927. They, made the, they claimed that the only way this could be 
explained, and we're going to try and explain it here now, is that we, they were observing diffraction of electron waves. Now, this is different than x-rays. Remember, the, the electrons interact very strongly with the atoms of the material. And so they, they had to rationalize this in terms of the interaction with just the first few layers of, of atoms. Now, it was a 1-1-1 plane. So a 1-1-1 plane on a surface of nickel looks something like this. It's a close packed plane. And I'm going to draw it, obviously, with the atoms shrunk a bit from their real size, so you can see it. And there you can see the close packed plane of the 1-1-1 nickel plane. And that's just the first layer. And of course, there's atoms below this, as you know. But they could rationalize their observation by just looking at that first layer. So how could they do that? Well, you know that nickel is an FCC structure. Oops. <laughs> And there's one back here, one back here, one back here, and one back here. And here's one of these 111 planes. Right there. Here's one of those 111 planes. We know that this is A. That means this distance is radical 2, uh, radical 2A. And that means this distance, so that between these the edges of this triangle that's shown here is radical 2 over 2a. So in other words, this distance, let's say from here to here, is radical 2 over 2a. Now, let's imagine electrons smacking into these these atoms. They then scatter off. And they come off randomly. It's an, let's say we, it's an elastic collision. So they come off. They're, they're here with some wavelength. They smack into this. And they scatter off randomly in, um, in any direction. But since it's elastic, they now have the same wavelength. They have the same energy. And they're doing that. Each one of these atoms is like a beacon of electron radiation spreading out in all directions. Now, think of what that meant with our wave tank last time. Our wave tank, we had plane waves here, and we had these waves come out like this. And of course, there was constructive and destructive interference that was occurring as a result of, of that. And that's what's going to happen here. And the best way to figure that out is to say, well, now there is a row of beacons right here, and a row of beacons right here. And they are some distance apart. So this is like one slit. Here's another slit. The distance they are apart, I'm going to call d prime. It's right like that. You can see this is 60 degrees here. It should be 60 degrees. I don't know about my drawing. It's a right triangle. And so I can calculate what d prime is given this. So d prime ends up being, uh, what is it? Radical 2a. Radical 2 over 2a sine 60. Right? So this is 60 degrees. This is the y. That's the longest side. So yeah, d prime is the sine of 60 degrees times this thing. And so I, can, I know what a is. We calculated a last time for nickel. I better get it right. That's 3.53 degrees, or angstrom, sorry. 
And so D prime ends up being 2.17 angstroms. Okay, so now that we know how far apart our beacons are, how far apart our slits are, we're going to have to assess whether there's diffraction and what angle diffraction occurs at. Yep. Oh, sorry. So um, which distance is A? This, A is, of course, the lattice constant for nickel. And we calculated that last time. And you know how to do that, right? Let's, okay. I, I'm going to do it. So how do you calculate the lattice constant? Well, what you do is you look on your periodic table for the density. And I, of course, we're, it's the density of nickel in this case. And then, if you know the density, that's the mass over the volume. So let's look at the mass over the volume of a unit cell. And how many atoms in a face center cubic unit cell? Four times the mass of a nickel atom. That's how much a, a, a unit cell weighs. And if I divide that by its volume, what's its volume? A cubed. So this one here you get from, the, that's the molecular weight of nickel, in this case, and you divide that by Avogadro's number to get the mass of an atom. And then, so now you, this is on your periodic table, this is on your periodic table, and this you can calculate from this. Yes, sir? Is this D prime a different D from the one you get by dividing A over the root of A? <coughs> Yes. Okay. That's for planes. This is the distance between. So here's electron diffraction. Remember I said if they don't go way into this crystal. I mean, they're, they're electrons, right? They interact very strongly with these. So these are just banging into the atoms on the surface. So what is the wavelength of our 54 volt electrons? Well, 54 volts, their energy is 54 EV which, of course, is the same as the kinetic energy or that we remember from de Broglie, this is h over the wavelength. The momentum is h over the wavelength. So the energy is just h squared over 2m lambda squared. And so we can solve for lambda. We got everything here. That's on your table of constants. This is the mass of the electron. Right? Sorry, I should have put that here. Mass of the electron. That's the energy. That's 54 EV. And when you do this, you get lambda is 1.67 angstrom. Now I'm going to go sit here and look at my two slits, D prime apart. And I'm going to look down this axis. So this is the surface. Here's the rest of the crystal. And I've got radiators D prime apart. And I got a, my waves, my electron waves coming down like this, and they're scattered off at some angle, theta. If this is theta here, I have a right. The path difference is what? The path difference is going to be just this length, which is just going to be d prime sine theta. And if I'm going to get diffraction at that angle of these electrons, it better be some multiple of the wavelength of the electrons. So this is the wavelength of the electrons that we just calculated here. Well, we know d prime. We calculated that right there. Oh, and we know the wavelength of the electrons. We calculated that there. So we can calculate theta. And theta ends up being 50.3 degrees. So that was in 1927. They won the Nobel Prize two years later. 
for this. Because right. this was the first time. So Du Bois, you know, what he published his thesis. He wanted to know about prize, but you know, it was all kind of theoretical. It was outside of your human ex experience. You couldn't see particles behaving like waves, you know, in everyday experience. Where here are these guys, in a, now the ubiquitous, ubiquitous gas discharge tube, it, they were observing it every day because of this non-uniform scattering. 